you said question everything. And that is not only for us as physicians to qu ask questions, but for the individual who's listening to this, question everything going on around us. Beyond pharmaceuticals for cardiac issues, whether it's high blood pressure, cholesterol, coronary disease, AFib, you're not gonna live long. You're just, you're not gonna make it. Welcome to the Health Fix Podcast, where health junkies get their weekly fix of tips, tools, and techniques to have limitless energy, sharp minds, and fit physiques for life. Hey, health junkies. On this episode of the Health Fix Podcast, I'm interviewing Dr. Jack Wolfson. He is a conventionally trained cardiologist, and he practiced for 16 years in the conventional medicine realm till he turned over to becoming a functional medicine doctor and has been for the last 12 years. He's actually one of the top 50 functional medicine docs in the US, and he has a lot to say about the practice of cardiology, and he's all about educating on the 100-year heart and brain and the lifestyle it takes to get there. So let's introduce you to Dr. Jack Wolfson. Dr. Jack Wolfson, welcome to the Health Fix Podcast. Thank you so much, Dr. Janine. It's a pleasure to be on. I've been a fan of yours and I know, you know, for years and I know that we've, you know, exchanged patients, you know, over the years and continue to support each other. Just love the stuff that you're doing. Love the naturopathic community. Uh, we employ a couple of naturopathic docs at Natural Heart Doctor. And again, we've got a school down in Arizona and I've actually mentored students for years and years and years from that school. So uh, it's, a, it's an honor to be on. Thank you. Well, my pleasure. And definitely so many questions, so many things. But first and foremost, with all of my podcasts, I always ask, why cardiology? What drew you to it? What lit you up about it? What, what, what about, what is it? Well, you know, my my father was a cardiologist, uh, and so I, I like to say that I was born into the cardiology world or the medical matrix, uh, if you will. So I'm listening. I'm in my mother's womb, and I'm listening to conversations about cardiology stuff, right? Uh, you know, with blood pressure, valvular heart disease, heart attacks, strokes. Uh, so really, from a young age, that's the stuff that I heard. And of course, I just my father was my hero. I wanted to be just like my father, and that's exactly what I did. So. After four years of undergrad, I went through 10 years of medical training, eventually to wind up as a cardiologist, a board certified cardiologist, uh, moved out to Arizona from Chicago in 2002 to join the biggest cardiology group uh, in, the, in the state. And uh, I would stay there for 10 years. But uh, as my career was taking off in 2002, right, you know, all the, all the patients, all the money, all the, all the success, all these things going on, uh, things were not going so well for my father. My father in his mid fifties was diagnosed with depression, just totally out of the blue. Uh, and then that would morph into more of like a movement disorder problem, Parkinsonianism. And then eventually we would take him to the Mayo Clinic and the Mayo Clinic would diagnose him with something called progressive supranuclear palsy or PSP. And it's similar to Parkinson's, but there's no, uh, there's no treatment for it. And there was no cause. They said, we have no idea why your father is sick and dying, but he will continue to be sick and progress and he will die within three years on average. Well, simultaneously and serendipitously, I was met, I uh, was introduced to a young woman, 29 year old chiropractor. And on our first get together, she proceeded to tell me exactly all the reasons why my father was sick and dying. You know, from the food he ate, the lifestyle, Chicago-based cardiologist, uh, took this neurotoxin called Lipitor, drank too much alcohol, um, you know, all, the, all these various things that we now talk about, right? Uh, and understand, uh, I didn't understand at the time in, in late 2004. Well, what she said made total sense. I started to change my personal life, my because I was living the same lifestyle, my medical practice life. And eventually I would leave that big group. I would marry that woman. Now we've got four children. Uh, and as I told you before, we recorded six goats, 18 chickens, uh, two cats and a dog. So uh, it's been quite the quite the journey. But I will, I'll wrap it up with this. <clears throat> you know, my father's uh, loss and demise uh, will not go uh, in vain. It created the man, the physician that I am today. Uh, and uh, for, you know, for that, I'm thankful to, to God. I'm thankful to my father, uh, you know, for all those, uh, you know, gifts. It's, it's powerful when we have experiences like that. And then we somehow meet someone that's going to help us to the next level. That's awesome. Now, of course, I surveyed some folks before the podcast and and wanted to see, okay, what do you guys want to know about cardiology? What do you want to know? What are the hot topics? And one of the biggest things we started talking about before we hit record is 
women, their hearts and hormones and how that kind of plays out. But one of the things you mentioned was, was broken heart syndrome, something that I've heard blurbs of, but not dove, dove much into it. So please tell us a little bit about that so we can, we can understand what this is and why it's hitting 40 to 60 year old women who are stressed. Yeah. You know, it's uh, you know, we all debate the food part of the story, right? Like what should we, what should we not eat? How much of it should we eat? Uh, and we talk about different lifestyle things and, you know, how much, how important sleep and sunshine and physical activity. Yeah. But, but we forget about the think well part of the story of eat well, live well, think well. And the think well is all about the people and certainly women who are stressed, anxious, depressed, uh, feel socially isolated in many cases, uh, worry, fear, which I believe that mainstream wants us to feel uh, they want us under chronic stress because as you know when you're under chronic stress and you're watching the television they're selling you more stress and then boom they want to sell you prozac you know in the commercial that comes up next but there are specific concerns that are medical diagnoses for women right so women uh, for example age you know group 40 to 60 they fit typically they'll fall into this diagnosis of broken heart syndrome professionally known as Takasubo cardiomyopathy. It's a Japanese word that whatever, it doesn't really matter the, the root of the word. What matters is, is that women who are under stress and especially this acutely stressful event, maybe an argument with a spouse or the loss of a loved one or uh, an argument with a boss or loss of a job or something with your child, this stressful event that leads to a heart attack. But it's not the classic heart attack. So we go in there with catheters. We take pictures during an angiogram. And there's no blockage. There's no coronary artery disease that's seen. So it's not typical. It is likely a spasm where like the artery just clamps down, leading to a massive heart attack. Uh, and even women dying in this scenario. Or maybe this stress generates a, a, a clot phenomenon. So now you get a blood clot in the artery that leads to this heart attack under a stressful situation. So um, Takazubo cardiomyopathy is one particular thing. Now what to do about it, obviously, is to... Uh, do all the things that you and I talk about all the time, right? So, you know, eat the right foods, live the right lifestyle, think the right thoughts, uh, try at our best to avoid these acutely stressful situations. Although, of course, that's not easy to do. But I think if we're the healthiest version of ourselves, we can prevent those things. So that's Takasubo cardiomyopathy. The other, other thing I want to bring out, too, is this diagnosis of SCAD, a spontaneous coronary artery dissection. Uh, one of my patients has been on uh, you know, Dr. Oz like several times talking about this and awareness of this. Uh, and this is, again, where uh, a woman, uh, for many different reasons, but uh, sometimes under acute stress, they will have a shearing of the blood vessel. So basically the blood vessel tears or dissects, uh, leading to a massive heart attack and all kind of complications from it. And women are, and I think all these numbers are going up for all the reasons that we know. We just live in a more toxic, polluted, stressful, unhealthy planet than we ever have before. And we're going to see more of these things, not less. Yeah. Do you think, I mean, I know this is a loaded question because it's it's where we the society we live in, but do you think the vaccines had something to do with the SCAD increase or do you think it's more toxicity or kind of a combination or hard to pin? Well, I mean, I will say this. Uh, I mean, I, that's that's a pretty big uh, loaded question, Dr. Janine, for early in the podcast. I appreciate it because I love it. You know, listen, we view everything through what we call the 100 year heart method. And I know you're doing the same thing, right? You may call it something different, but it's just about the eat well, the live well, the think well. And living well is about avoiding chemicals and it's about avoiding prescription drugs and all the toxins that we talk about. So some injectable pharmaceutical is a toxin. And what that does to the population in general, what it does to the individual, we have no clue, certainly not to the individual. Now, as it relates to the population, yeah, we've seen lots of cases of myocarditis, uh, cardiac rhythm disorders, heart attacks. Somebody could come along and say, well, you know, uh, we saw a lot of things from COVID, you know, itself. And again, uh, th there's a lot of questions. I always err on the side of giving the body what it needs, taking away what it doesn't. Now, if you say, if we inject uh, the COVID shot that generates an immune response, 
uh, by generating, this is the alleged mechanism, right? Generating trillions of these spike protein particles that now the immune system will recognize what does that mean to to our health in general when you have this incredible immunostimulation? What does it mean that you now you're producing antibodies not only to spike protein but possibly to actin or myosin or other proteins that are found inside of a blood vessel inside of the the media the the muscular tissue for example uh, or anything really in that area the the answer is anything is possible uh, and. Time will tell how much damage was in fact done. Hopefully the truth will, you know, will, will come out. But um, certainly if I'm someone who has SCAD, I would look at, you know, was was a vaccine involved. Uh, but looking at the lens of kind of anything that would happen at that time, maybe it was a, an antibiotic that they took, you know, at that time. Maybe it was some kind of, you know, life experience, stressful experience. Maybe they put a cell phone tower on top of your roof, you know, or you got a smart meter or you got new furniture, new paint, new flooring, uh, maybe water damage in the home, you had a flood and that, and then, you know, two weeks later you had a SCAD event. Uh, and, and that's the beauty of what you and I do is that we take that super duper in-depth history to determine what happened. What happens in the medical world when you come in with a SCAD event or with Takasubo cardiomyopathy is you get pharmaceuticals. That's all That's all that you get in their world. You don't get any, uh, you know, inquiring into why. And once you learn the why, then hopefully you can prevent another event because SCAD is often recurrent. And that, I'm so glad you mentioned that. That's kind of where I'm going there with, with all of the push for subsequent boosters and things of that nature. I'm starting to to really help folks question things, question everything. And while it may be hard to pinpoint something, at least like you mentioned, you know, did we have a new smart meter? Every Thinking about everything in your environment that could also be a, pa a, a pattern that could help to identify things. So important. Now, when people are thinking about their cardiovascular health, what are some of the things, you know, I've seen your labs, like you guys, he does an amazing job with the labs. It's very good, very detailed, like a very good overall check. Now, what other types of things can folks be looking for on their own to monitor their own cardiovascular health? What kind of things do you educate on? Well, I, you know, we all talk about, uh, you know, cholesterol, cholesterol, uh, uh, has been you know discussed for 50 plus years has been vilified for that many years uh and cholesterol is a molecule to be celebrated uh, there's no uh, ldl is not bad and hdl is not good i mean ldl is a purpose hdl is a purpose that's all pharmaceutical companies speak and let me use this quick interlude here to say to just to repeat what you said before you said question everything and that is not only for us as physicians to qu ask questions, but for the individual who's listening to this, question everything going on around us. Mm -hmm. We should question everything, and we always want the freedom to question everything, because the freedom to question that uh, as it relates to, yeah, censorship, whether it's on social media or the freedom to ask these questions amongst our friends and our peers and our family. Like, let's have these discussions mm -hmm. because, uh, I mean, again, uh, the, the inquiring about all this stuff is absolutely paramount. Um, I, so so short, quick answer to what you asked. I think the most important thing are markers of inflammation and oxidative stress. Okay. Um, and there's a beautiful oxidative stress test you can do at home, right? You, it's a urine test. You can check for lipid peroxides in the urine. Uh, love that particular test. Um, and because ultimately, if your lipids are abnormal, if your inflammatory markers are abnormal, your oxidative stress markers are abnormal, your homocysteine is abnormal, your hormones are abnormal, your thyroid's abnormal, right? We want to know why. We want to know why they're abnormal. And then we want to fix the why. And then when we fix the why, things miraculously resolve, which is pretty darn cool. So it, it so is. So what I'm hearing you say is look at the markers of inflammation and, and start there. Now, if someone, you know, one of the things you had mentioned is folks will come to the ER, especially women um, will go to the ER and say, I just don't feel right. And I'll hear this a lot 
from women. I just don't feel good in my body anymore. I just don't feel right. Now, of course, in my office, we're checking all the, the markers to be like, okay, what's going on? But in someone that say they haven't had any inflammation markers checked, nobody's been really monitoring. Maybe their primary care doctor did an EKG in the office and, you know, 10 years ago and said they were fine. What kind of just don't feel right? Would you say equates go to the ER versus get in touch with natural heart doctor? You know, how, how, how do folks want to differentiate those kind of things? Well, the one thing that I talk to people about, right, is whenever their complaint is like there's safety in time, <laughs> there is safety in time. So if someone said to you, right, Dr. Janine, they're like, you know, Dr. Krause, um, uh, I've had this headache. It's been going on for like five years. You think it's a brain tumor. And you'd be like, I don't think it's a brain tumor. It's been going on for five years. Like if it was a tumor, you know, we would know about it already. So when someone says, I don't feel right or something, you know, I got fatigue, low energy, and it's been going on for, you know, for weeks and more and stuff like that. I think then we can, yeah, take it back a peg and, and you know, then, then figure it out. But I think for these situations where the woman in general is feeling pretty good or whatever, like a sudden change, as you know, then that, you know, kind of kicks it up a level as far as, you know what's going on but i think what what's historically happened is that uh this woman shows up in the emergency room uh or even in our office yeah, but again like you know they show up in the emergency room and they're like i just don't feel right and then they get neglected they get pushed to the side they don't look at what's going on from a cardiac standpoint uh the medical doctors mostly men of course are trained you know at at you know looking at what's called levine sign with that you know hand over the chest or fist over the chest it's pressure in the chest sweaty, arm pain, neck pain, nauseous. Sometimes women don't fit that mold as classically as the men do. And I think, again, it just it just really highlights the importance of, as, as you and I both learned in our medical training, right? Just taking a very detailed, thorough history, which the medical doctors don't have much time to do. They've got these super short office visits uh, and certain you know bullets that they have to hit. And when I did this for many years, when a person walks through the door of our examination consultation room, we're thinking about how do we get this person out as fast as possible? So we try and identify you know what their what their most pressing issue is, and then identify what kind of pharmaceutical or test that we can order on that person in order to expedite the whole process because we've got a waiting room full of insurance based people. Now you get over to our side over here, and it's like, hey, this is where real health lives. This is where this you know sickness lives over there, and continued sickness lives over there. You know, I mean, one thing I love to say too, you know, Dr. Janine, is that. Uh, you know, life expectancy in the United States for men is about 75 and women, it's, you know, about 78. Like, that's horrible. <laughs> that's horrific. Um, I'm not going to talk about you and your age, but I'm 53 and my father died at 63 and I've got young children. I don't want to die. So uh, this this whole idea of 75 for the average male, like that's not that's not good. I don't want that. Uh, that's that is not good enough. We're the home of the 100 year hearts uh, and we're not going to achieve it inside of the medical community. We're just not. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And and yeah, the older you get, the the closer you get to what the average lifespan is, the more you're like, or at least my case, I'm like, okay, what else can I do? What else can I do? Now, of course, the cholesterol conundrum does come up with a lot of folks. As we get older, cholesterol does seem to tend to go higher and folks can be completely fit. They can be working out, you know, five, six days a week. They can be eating impeccably and still the cholesterol just doesn't budge. And of course, for a lot of folks, they'll have maybe me and then they'll have a primary care doc and the primary care doc's on them. Like you got to start you got to start a statin, you got to start a statin. And then they're coming to me and going like, what's my, what's my alternative? And so I would love to hear from you because I heard you mention neurotoxin Lipitor with dad. Hey, health junkies struggling with sleep as a former insomniac. I can relate. Devin Burke is a pal of mine. He has the sleep science Academy. He's been on my podcast twice and we've talked a lot about how to work on sleep naturally, without supplements, without medications. Devin's program really does work with you to help you understand what is going on in your brain and body when it comes to sleep. And as a listener of the Health Fix podcast, he's given us a code for 10% off of his program, DRJ10. So if you're interested, use that. I highly recommend his program. So let's get back to the podcast. But we've got folks out there saying like microdosing of 
you know, the the different cholesterol meds, the statins, and then microdosing the zetias and things. And and we have research that says that that's beneficial. But at the same time, are we doing more harm than good in these situations? So I would love to hear your take on this. Yeah. So um, as it relates to the data on microdosing of pharmaceuticals, there really is not much data or science uh, on that whatsoever. Uh, these people are experimenting outside of uh, outside of the guidelines, which I'm all um, which I'm all good with because I'm totally outside of the guidelines, if you will. The guidelines are written by pharmaceutical companies, but the idea of taking uh, you know small dose of statin or uh, zetamiba, I'm, I'm totally against. I'm just anti pharmaceutical. They just do not have a role for any way, shape, or form in my in my patients. I would never take it myself. Uh, one thing that uh, that statin drugs do. Uh, let's talk about many things. So they inhibit the production of cholesterol. That obviously we know. Cholesterol level, levels drop, LDL levels drop precipitously. They also interfere with the production of CoQ10. CoQ10 is in the mitochondria, electron transport chain, cellular energy, cellular water, critically important. We need CoQ10. Uh, so they interfere with that. They also interfere with something called heme A. Heme A uh, is a protein compound that is found in the fourth uh, cytochrome in the electron transport chain. So they interfere with that. So now you're making less cellular energy on a statin drug. Another thing that they inhibit is something called dolacol. Dolacol is a steroid-like hormone that is found in the substantia nigra of the midbrain. So when you de decrease the production of dolacol, and you, which is no longer present in the substantia nigra of the midbrain, maybe you get more risk of Parkinson's and Parkinsonian disorders like my father's PSP. And that is in the literature in many studies. So um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not taking any statin drugs. Uh, to, uh, and, and the reality is, is that statin drugs at their best in secondary prevention decrease heart attack risk on an annual basis, say 3% to 2.5%. So if you want 3% versus 2.5%, if you're like, oh, I'm cool with that. Okay, right. But the world where you and I operate, Dr. Janine, is we operate in the 0% heart attack risk group. So a, a lot of talking heads in the media, again, uh, it's just uh, it, it's just the way that I roll. I'm not I've not I have not prescribed a statin drug in over 10 years. I'm not going to. Azetamib, I think, is garbage. Uh, PCSK9 inhibitors like Repatha and others are totally experimental. And actually, the biggest study uh, that was produced on those was done uh, five years ago. It was produced. It was in the New England Journal of Medicine where they looked at a Repatha. And what they found is that the Repatha group did have less heart attacks and strokes by a little bit. But it's interesting that more people died in the Repatha group. You don't hear too much about that. It wasn't statistically significant, but tell that to the 18 uh, extra people who died in the Repatha group. So, yeah, you know, I, let me let me finally again, like cholesterol is critical. We can't live without it. It's all of our hormones, all of our digestion, right? I mean, all the women out there who are talking about, you know, hormone replacement and stuff like that. I mean, where do you think the hormones come from? Uh, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, they come from cholesterol. And if you lower the level artificially, you're going to be sorry. Uh, cholesterol, of course, makes our vitamin D. The sun hits cholesterol, uh, turns it into vitamin D. It's for our digestion. All of our cells have a fence called cell membrane loaded with cholesterol. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's a molecule to be celebrated and uh, not vilified. And so basically what I tell folks when we look at this is we're treating labs, really. We're not treating the person, we're treating the labs. And we're like, oh, looky, looky here, we've got the cholesterol down, mission accomplished. But in the end, yeah, if I'm going for a 2%, the, it, it doesn't make sense. And I, I totally understand that. The PS, the, I always say it wrong, the PSK9s, Repatha, those kind of things, those ones... I've had some cases, and so I'd love to hear your, your take. This is me asking. Um, no one in my community asked about this. Is I've got a couple of patients with really high calcium scores, and we're told that they had to be in either a high-dose cholesterol med or do a PSK-9. And what, what have you traditionally done with really high calcium scores and folks who are super fit? Um, let's, let's put it in the boxing category, pre-UFC kind of fighter kind of status. What would you yeah. do in that case? just for folks who might be listening going, I have a really high calcium score. Yeah, so, you know, as far as calcium scores uh, are concerned, I'm not a big fan of the test, uh, to say the okay. least. I don't like radiation. I believe radiation uh, is one of the things that killed my father as a cardiologist, of course. Now, somebody would say, well, 
the radiation is not that much. Um, it's like the same as flying from here to Tokyo, like radiation exposure. And I would say, well, I'm not flying from here to Tokyo. Uh, if I did, I would, if, I, if I was flying there, I would have a reason. Like I want to go see like some museum or some Buddhist temple or something like that. Like I would have, have reason to go to Tokyo. Uh, and therefore I would understand the risks and benefits. What is the benefit of doing a calcium scan? Okay, now you identified that you've got the worst calcium score in the world. Now, what are we gonna do, Dr. Janine, right? Are we gonna put that person on a statin? PCSK9, I'm not, somebody else may. Calcium scores reflect what's been going on for a lifetime, including in utero, including actually before conception. Huh? Before conception, the behaviors that were going on in our, in our, you know, in our mother and our father impact how we are as adults. So that being said, uh, again, the calcium score reflects what's been going on for years. What reflects what's going on right now are markers of inflammation, oxidative stress. If you have inflammation, oxidative stress, you better figure out why. And it's not because you have a statin deficiency or a repatha deficiency. That's the best strategy. Um, that's how I would look at that. But again, there's so much that's out there. I tend to be the biggest purist. I know you're, you know, that you're, uh, you know, in alignment with all these things. And it's, I, again, like where there are a lot of natural doctors out there that. Uh, recommend CT scans. There's a lot of natural doctors that will spot use uh, the pharmaceuticals. I just think that, listen, God bless the men and women who work in emergency rooms and trauma centers. Yeah, for sure. But when it comes to the prevention, the treatment and reversal of chronic disease, it's not going to be in a pill bottle. It's not going to be injectable. Uh, it's not going to be found in the medical community uh, at, at this point in time. Wholeheartedly agree. That being said, of course, I want to dive into the other side of medicine that that isn't as popular, but hopefully it's going to gain some popularity. Talking about energy medicine, talking about the energy of the heart, the electrical capacity, you know, things like heart math, those types of things. For stress, what is kind of how are you helping folks to to work on changing their thoughts? Right? How are you working on the stress side of things with natural heart doctor? What, what kind of things do you guys recommend, folks, so that we can change over to Let's call it the light side of medicine. Yeah, and I talk about you know chapter five of my book. It's uh, it's called um, uh, you know One Nation Under Prozac, and what we do there is we highlight all of the evidence that says that stress essentially is bad. Right? Stress, anger, anxiety, depression, social isolation, how they are linked to increased uh, risk of cardiovascular disease. Childhood trauma, markedly higher risk of cardiovascular disease. PTSD, markedly higher risk. You know, Janine, uh, Janine, I'll point, uh, uh, you know, throw this back out, you know, with you again, like what, what happens uh, after someone gets a medical diagnosis? Like what is the PTSD related to the fact that I've already had a heart attack? I've already had a stroke. I've had a precancerous lesion. I've got this. I mean, again, like that's got to be, there's, there's got to be something that we need to unpack from there. Uh, I recognize my limitations, that's for sure. So I love to refer people out for professional help and all those different things to just to get them to identify like, hey, I'm not the worldwide expert as it relates to, you know, stress reduction techniques uh, and even some of these biohacking things, as you mentioned, heart math, uh, you know, brain tap and other things that could be helpful there. The, the purpose of me really is to say, hey, you need to get out there in this uh, you know arena. We do have other, you know, coaches and stuff like that on our team that we help with those certain things, try and point people in the right direction. Uh to the right research. One thing I did a quick video on yesterday as it relates to just an acute stress reliever, which is alternate nostril breathing. Whenever I do that, and as an example, and I go through that whole, you know, sequence of doing that, uh, I find that I personally, right, I just get taken down a few pegs as far as my stress level is concerned. Uh, but it, it's an area that people really need to delve into, but it, it all plays in together. So when you're eating well, you deal with stress better. When you're getting appropriate sleep and sunshine and physical activity and chiropractic care, staying away from toxins, holistic dentistry, when you're doing all those things, you tend to deal with stress that much better, becoming that optimal version of you. But it's it's a big area that the medical doctors get zero training and we get zero. I, and I'll even go back to my psych rotation. My psych rotation was a one month inpatient in downtown inner city Chicago psychiatric rotation 
where it was all about mega dose pharmaceuticals. It wasn't like I'm Sigmund Freud and lay down on the couch and tell me about your mother. Like that wasn't that it was all, you know, and that's the way the medical doctors are trained. Uh, and we're trained like, you know, uh, you know, 50 year old woman comes in and like, ah, you know, I just don't feel right. You know, I just, you know, I just don't have a lot of energy and I'm just, you know, things aren't going to, I got no zest for life. And we're like, boom, prescription, you know, here's, here's this new one, new one, new one, new one, new one. And the, I mean, that's, it's a multi, multi, multi billion dollar industry uh, and it's a failure. So again, I appreciate the opportunity to be on here to talk to, you know, you know, people and, and I'll share this certainly with my entire tribe because people need to hear this message um and it's uh it's it truly is life or death yes absolutely absolutely so being the the subject of life or death and and the connection to inflammation and inflammaging all that kind of concept what are some of your go-tos in terms of helping people reduce their inflammation just to give folks a sense of where they maybe could start looking, doing some research, getting getting familiar with these kind of things. Well, you, uh, you're up in the in the uh, you know Seattle Tacoma area, right? And when I think about the Pacific Northwest, I think about seafood. I think about wild salmon. I think about clams, oyster, shrimp, lobster, crab. Like I think about the best seafood available. And that is one penultimate way to lower inflammation. Uh, seafood is the number one healthiest food in the entire world. After that, we want to reach for organs like uh, bison liver, bison heart, things like that, I think are paramount. Um, as it relates to you know inflammation, sunshine lowers inflammation, sleep lowers inflammation, physical activity movement does, avoiding the toxins that cause inflammation, detoxification, detoxification strategies, uh, supplements in that arena that help with detoxification, gut healing. I, I think, you know, it's interesting that uh, the way that I've used it, when I met my wife in 2004, she said, it's about the gut, about the gut, about the gut. And I said, what's about the gut? Like, what are you talking about? What does the gut have to do with the heart? That's, I mean, they're, they're two, two totally, to, to, totally separate uh, uh, systems. And she's like, no, knucklehead, they're not separate systems. They're totally intertwined. Like everything in the body is intertwined, right? I mean, I mean, Jeannie, this is where I was coming from, right? So uh, as it relates to these environmental toxins, mold, mycotoxins, bacterial toxins, things, things from water damaged building, mold from food, uh, and then everything else, plastic, phthalates, parabens, uh, uh, BPAs, uh, VOCs, pesticides, they destroyed the gut microbiome, leading to intestinal hyperpermeability, leaky gut. These things enter the body, immune system activation, inflammation, ox stress, death. That's just the way that it goes. That's the whole, you know, system. Uh, so in that sense, yeah, like what are the supplements we could use to help, you know, repair the gut, right? So is it is it probiotics? The answer is yes. Is it things like, uh, you know, butyrate, CalMag, things to, uh, you know, immunoglobulins to quiet down gut inflammation. Um, and, and that's kind of, again, like, you know, we eat well, live well, think well, do the testing that's necessary. And then those evidence-based supplements are just that. They're evidence-based. They're going to work. You and I have seen it in the literature. We've seen it in our, our patients. Uh, and, and they're going to work, but, um, you know, the, the gut heart access, the gut brain, uh, access, it's, uh, it's, it's everything, you know, and, and it, it's a beautiful thing. It's very empowering. I mean, you know, from where I came from, like, uh, to wake up to this epiphany moment and like, wow, there's just so much that we can do. I think one thing where we could struggle with, and maybe we're even our patients struggle with is that there's so much that we could do, right? Being a conventional cardiologist, super simple. Oh, hi, you know, Mr. Jones, your cholesterol is high. Take this statin drug. Bye. Get a stress test on your way out. Like that's what happens. And it's a 20 second visit. Now in the world where you and I work, it's like, there's a thousand different biohacking strategies. Oh, I heard on this podcast about red light. I heard about cold plunge. I heard about sauna. I heard about HBOT. I heard about ozone. I heard about methylene blue. Like, you know, it's never ending, which is good. Uh, but again, we always just go back to those foundation things. Um, let, let me tell you another uh, uh, term I like. It's, it's like the 4S strategy. Ready? Sleep, sunshine, seafood, and then I'll throw in what we'll call sexercise. So it gives me that extra S. It points out that intimacy is very important. Uh, and then the fact that I create this 
uh, portmanteau of, of the word sex and exercise into sex exercise uh, makes sure that we include physical activity and movement with that as well. Uh, but I, I think you hit those foundational things and you're going to be, uh, you're going to be in a good place. Oh my goodness. Love it. People pay more attention when the word sex is involved. So there, there you have it. So Dr. Wilson, you've told us a lot of stuff. You've given us a lot of good nuggets. I would love for folks to hear more about natural heart doctor, because it sounds like basically everything you just gave us is probably what's going on there in terms of looking at foundations and moving forward. So let's give folks an idea of how they can find you, where they can find you and how they can jump in and get a consult with you or one of the docs at natural health doctor. Yeah, for sure. Listen, I mean, you know, if you, if you have cardiovascular concerns, uh, you know, feel free to give us a call. The website's naturalheartdoctor.com. We're all over social media, same place. Uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, sometimes a lot of what we do is we give like this third opinion. So it's like, you know, you're working with Dr. Janine and, you know, you know, she's talking about, you know, one way your traditional medical doctor says another, maybe, you know, we could be the tiebreaker. Uh, but, uh, you know, warning, we're going to just, we're going to wind up on the side of Dr. Janine is where that's going to roll. Uh, but, uh, you know, cause again, like that's our expertise, you know, I spent 16 years as a conventional cardiologist and now, you know, uh, 12 years in my own practice of natural heart doctor. So I've seen both sides, which I think makes, uh, m- makes my perspective, uh, you know, very interesting and hopefully, you know, respected, you know, to people. But, uh, if you're on multiple farm, I mean, was, essentially if you're on pharmaceuticals for cardiac issues, whether it's high blood pressure, cholesterol, coronary disease, AFib, you're not going to live long. You're just, you're not going to make it. It's just, it's in the literature. It's common sense. You're not going to make it. And if you want to make it, if you want the hundred year heart, 100 year lifestyle, 100 year brain, uh, you better work with uh, uh, natural healthcare practitioners. Well said, well said. Well, Dr. Wilson, thank you so much for coming on and sharing all of your great wisdom with us. I am excited to send this podcast out. Thanks again. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, fellow health junkie, thanks for listening to the Health Fix podcast. If you enjoyed tuning in, Please help support me to get the word out about the podcast. Subscribe, rate, and review, and just get that word out. Thanks again for listening.